Hello, this is Pastor Jay with 431 Global Ministries with today's devotional prayer. Today's devotional prayer is taken from the book of Matthew. Of course, Matthew was written by the one who bears the name. At least that's who uh, all the early church fathers attributed uh, the writings to. In fact, even... Uh, Echinacius, the bishop of Antioch, uh, he attributed these works to Matthew. Matthew, no doubt, according to most scholars, wrote this after the destruction of Jerusalem, after 70 AD, and he wrote it over a period of years uh, there as he was presiding in Antioch, the same place that Echinacius was located. And, of course, when you look at the theme of it and you look at the, the variances of it, you can really see here that um, the, the, the theme was the kingdom is here. The kingdom has been inaugurated. We're in the new covenant. That is kind of stretched forward throughout the whole book, that the kingdom of God is now operating. And that, that's why uh, Matthew spoke of the kingdom the kingdom more than any other gospel writer. And of course, um, we, we look at it, we see some Aramaic that was found in it. This was primarily uh, written, uh, presented in Greek, but there was some expressions of Aramaic which they say directly came from Matthew. Uh, Matthew being a Jew, being right there uh, in the, as a tax collector in Jerusalem, um, this, no doubt, was actually direct quotes from him. And so, we, we have a very, very good book here, a profound book, um, a, a very uh, heartfelt book. And in it, we find um, a whole lot of, um, you could say, Jewish flavor mixed with the Christians, the, the Christian flavor. Uh, it's all rolled up into one book here. And it, it, of course, it came to us from uh, the Matthew, Matthew the writer. Um, tonight's scripture is a scripture that we are hearing a lot about right now. Uh, there, the CDC has proclaimed that we are now in a pandemic here in America, or actually in the whole world. There's a pandemic, and um, there's a scripture that you may hear a whole lot of religious people. Uh, maybe even here on YouTube or in other places that are quoting. And we're going to read this scripture and we're going to offer a prayer in, in reference to it. Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through 8. It says, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Surely I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will all these things be? What will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famine, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Note our prayer. Our Father, this passage is being cited much now. That is why we consider this passage today. What we primarily see is Jesus was quitting the temple and his public work there. He had said in the close of the foregoing chapter, Your house is left unto you desolate. And here he has made his words good. He went out and departed from the temple. The manner of expression is observable. He not only went out of the temple, but departed from it, took his final farewell of it. He departed from it, never to return to it anymore, and then immediately follows a prediction of its ruin. Three days after this, 
The veil of the temple was rent when he left it. All became common and unclean. But Christ departed not till they drove him away, did not reject them till they first rejected him. But here Jesus has a private discourse with his disciples concerning these things, and these things have been misunderstood today. Jesus had spoken of the destruction of the Jewish church to the multitude in parables, but here he explains to his disciples in private. As grieving that this house should be left desolate, they showed him the buildings as if they would move him to, re to reverse the sentence. But how soon they had forgotten how many providences concerning Solomon's temple had manifested how little you cared for that outward glory which they had so much admired when the people were wicked. Here he speaks of it as an utter ruin. The temple shall not only be stripped and plundered and defaced, but utterly demolished and laid waste. Not one stone shall be left upon another. History tells us this was fulfilled in the latter. For though Titus, when he took the city, did all he could to preserve the temple, yet he could not restrain the enraged soldiers from destroying it utterly. And it was done to that degree that Turnus Rufus plowed up the ground on which it had stood. Thus that scripture was fulfilled in Micah, that said, Zion shall for your sake be plowed as a field. Attempts were made to rebuild later to no avail until the day, until this day, where a mosque has been built on its foundation. The disciples, not disputing either the truth or the equity of this sent sentence, nor doubting of the accomplishment of it, inquire more particularly of the time when it should come to pass and the signs of its approach. Jesus sat down by the way of the Mount of Olives, directly faced the temple, and sat as a judge upon the bench, the temple and city being before him as the bar. And thus he passed sentence on them. Some think these questions do all point at one at the same thing, the destruction of the temple and the period of the Jewish church and nation, which Christ had himself spoken of as his coming, at which he would be, would be the con consummation of the age or the end of, of that world. Others think their question, when shall these things be, refers to the destruction of Jerusalem, and the other two other questions, the coming and the end, refers to his setting up his gospel kingdom, which he has done, and the end being the day of judgment. Many are inclined to think that their question looked no further than the event Christ now foretold, but it appears by other passages that they had very confused thoughts of future events. But our Master in His answer, though He does not expressively rectify the mistakes of His disciples, that would be done later by the pouring out of the Spirit, yet He looks further than their question, and He gives a host of signs that they saw just within a few short years after he said these things. Now the prophecy primarily respects the events near at hand, the destruction of Jerusalem, the period of the Jewish church and state, the calling of the Gentiles, and the setting up of Christ's kingdom in the world. But as the prophecies of the Old Testament, which have an immediate reference to the affairs of the Jews and the revolutions of their state, here Jesus foretells the going forth of deceivers, he begins with a caution. Seducers are more dangerous enemies to the church than persecutors. Three times in this discourse, he mentioned the appearing of false prophets and how these deceivers would pretend to have divine inspiration, an immediate mission, and a, and a spirit of prophecy when it was all a lie. Yes, they would come in Christ's name as his vicar, but invade and absurd all his offices. He foretold wars and great commotions among the nations. From the time that Jesus was rejected and left their house desolate, the sword did never depart from their house. He foretold other judgments more immediately from, from you. Famines, pestilences, and earthquakes. Famine is often the effect of war and pestilence of famine. Famine was signified by the black horse under the third seal in Revelation. But the worst famine that ever occurred was in Jerusalem during the siege. Pestilences was signified by the pale horse and death upon him. This destroys without distinction, and a little time lays heap upon heaps. 
When we look forward to the eternity of misery that is before the obstinate refusers of Christ and His gospel, we may truly say concerning the greatest temporal judgments that they are the beginning of sorrows. Bad as things are with them, there are worse behind. Yes, Father, these perilous days began when your people of old rejected Christ. And they continue today as we are ridiculed and persecuted by those who still don't believe. People take this Olivet Discourse and say that the pestilence that is spoken here is the pestilence we see today with the coronavirus. Father, I rebuke that notion. This pestilence has continued since the first century. The only difference is now that men play your part and can manipulate molecules under certain controlled environments and can even cause certain transfers of diseases to be manipulated as well. This is man's efforts, not your plagues. Yes, the evilness of man is what is behind many of the pestilences of man as well as many of the other first century signs. Yes, Father, it still continues. Father, give us a sound mind to deal with these issues. Awaken us to reality. Give us discernment to not only understand the context of your word, but the ability to know who our real enemy is. Bless those with healing who are going through the effects of this sickness and lead us far from the clutches of its reach. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, really understanding context in Scripture. Understanding why Matthew wrote what he wrote and why we say the theme of Matthew is the kingdom is here. Understanding that puts a whole different perspective on many things that we read in the Bible that we think are concerning to direct prophecies relating to the exact time in which we're living. When in essence it was actually referring to a different time. But despite that, there is still the message found in that prayer. Pestilences are still here. We in the world right now are experiencing it. We are also seeing the awful effects of man's efforts. Uh, many of them seem to be done on purpose. It appears on purpose that things are not being done, that things are being left behind, that things are they're not on top of their job. That It appears that that's what's happening. It appears that there's a manipulation in allowing certain things to happen. It seems like there's irresponsibility being shown in people who have positions of authority who can control, help control these things. What is it? could just be the evilness of man. could be an agenda. It could be a number of things. And I'm sure you all have your own opinions as I have mine. But just know this. We're still in the time of the end. Not the end of the Jewish world, as Matthew spoke of, but we are approaching the end of our age. Jesus will crack that sky. And every antichrist, every uh, uh, terrible and awful spirit that is trying to force people, influence people, and control people in an in a, in a awful way, that all those things will be destroyed when Jesus cracks that sky. And as Christians, as we face what we're facing, we have to have the faith that God's will will be done. If it's His will to bring an end to it all, then you know what I say? Come, Lord Jesus. Come. Bring an end to it. Let it culminate. But if He's not finished with the gospel, then Lord, we need Your protection. We need Your help. We need Your discernment. We need Your wisdom. Show us the way for our safety. So, Whatever the Lord's will is, is what we pray to be done. 
I'm not going to sit here and say I'm a prophet. I'm not going to claim to be a prophet. And I'm, I would be careful for people who do claim to be prophets today that they don't speak rashly because then they would be accused of being a false prophet. But just let the Lord's will be done and know that if you're in His will, you are safe under the shadow of His wings. That is my prayer for everyone hearing this message today. Be safe in the shadow of the wings of our Lord. May God bless each and every one of you. I pray you have a good night.